Thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks for the uh, CPM group and, and Kitco for having us here today. Uh, Norant is a, is a company based in Toronto and Canada and, and has a very, uh, very unique and very exciting mineral discovery in an area known as the Ring of Fire. Uh, and it's not just the Johnny Cash song. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a relation or a, a reference to the way that these deposits form. They're a magmatic massive sulfide system, and if you looked at it from outer space, it would look like a giant ring of fire. Uh, before we get too much further, of course, we'll have to have our forward-looking statement. I have to uh, include this by law. Basically says, don't believe a word I'm about to say, but I'm an honest guy, you can trust me. <laughs> Does. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned that the, the, the Ring of Fire is a, a unique system and, and I mean it's drawn a lot of attention in Canada. It's, it's actually brought uh, cliffs natural resources into the region, uh, largely on the strength of the chromite deposits that have been discovered there. The system itself is very similar to the Bushveld igneous complex in South Africa. Um, has chromite, massive chromite discoveries that will probably rival South Africa's at some point in time. Nickel sulfides, which we were fortunate enough to, to be the company to discover. And with the nickel sulfides, there's significant platinum and palladium credits. Uh, up right now, our current reserve is about 2.2 uh, million ounces of combined platinum and palladium. The ratio is three, platinum, or three palladium to one platinum. So it's, uh, this is a very unique deposit, great deal of value. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, primary roles in this business, and I've been in the mining game for over 30 years now, is grade is king. And that's one thing this deposit has in spades. It's a very high grade deposit. It's one of the few, probably one of the few new nickel sulfide discoveries in the last 20 years that have grades of over 2% nickel. Even the Ontario government sees the opportunity. And I mean, how often is it the government sees an opportunity somewhere? So the government calls it the most prom promising mining opportunity in, uh, in Canada in a century, and I don't think that they're far from the mark there. The presentation, by the way, is an iBook presentation. You might not be familiar with it. It's not. Uh, standard PowerPoint. Uh, we plan on putting everything, the, uh, everything that the company has uh, in terms of information up on iTunes so you can download it and view it as an iBook. Listed on the Venture Exchange of the Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, the very uh, promising symbol NOT. Uh, I'd like to change that, but don't have much of a choice. 52 week high and low of between 41 cents and a dollar. We have, uh, this is slightly outdated. Recently, we did a private placement with a company called Resource Capital Funds, which is a Denver-based uh, resource investment fund. They're now our largest shareholder. Uh, that took our float up to about 230 million shares issued and outstanding. And so our uh, fully diluted will be about 250 right now. As I mentioned, Resource Capital is our largest shareholder currently, about 17.8%. Uh, they have expressed an interest in increasing that position. Um, We'll see what the future brings. Second largest uh, shareholder is Bao Steel Resources, which is based out of China. It's a division of Bao Steel, one of the largest steel manufacturers in the world. Of course, they're investing or interested in Norant because of the, uh, the nickel and the chromite opportunity that's there. The remaining large investors are your typical Canadian resource investment funds, uh, guys that participated in a lot of our flow-through placements, which, of course, you don't have the opportunity of participating in in the U.S. And we have a small technical glitch here. There we go. Uh, that's not important. We'll skip by that. We'll skip by that. Skip by that. The history of Norant. Basically, the discovery was made in 2007. So this is a very young camp. It's only about five years old. And if you think about it, I'll put it to you in simple terms. There's been four mines discovered in five years. That's, that's a pretty good batting average. I don't think you're going to find that anywhere else in the world right now. Less than 10% of this camp has been explored. And the camp itself is four times the size of the Sudbury Basin, which has been in operation for over 100 years. So the upside potential in this district is huge. Norant is a small company. Our market cap is a little better than 100 million. We're trading at about 50 cents right now uh, in that level. Uh, it's very difficult for junior companies to find finance financing at the best of times. It becomes even more difficult when the market is being driven by uh, um, a lot of concern or a lot of risk, so uh, we're struggling, um, trying, to, uh, trying to come up with the financing at the best of times as junior companies. We had a decision to make once we made this discovery. Do we proceed to develop it as a mine and do the feasibility work, or do we proceed and continue to explore in the region and try to identify more and more mineral resources? I looked at that exploration model as sort of a, 
uh, an endless hamster wheel. We'd continue to go back to the market and do financing after financing after financing. Uh, we thought it was a much more opportunistic and much more value added um, strategy is to, to proceed developing our primary asset, which is the Eagle's Nest Nickel Sulfide System, and use cash flow from that, reinvest it into the camp, and grow the company the old-fashioned way, the way that uh, mining companies used to grow uh, uh, years and years ago. Uh, based on recent transactions, we're, of course, I'd be a terrible CEO if I stood up here and told you that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're valued fairly in the marketplace. Of course, we're horribly undervalued, and I believe that's true. I mean, if you look at it, uh, no matter how you look at it in terms of other nickel, nickel sulfide producers that are out there or um, on a resource basis level, uh, where, you're, where we're sitting on the chart is basically we're, we're significantly undervalued compared to most other companies. As much as uh, you see some of the Australian producers are valued at 10 times higher than what we are right now. And I know it's uh, not a focus of this uh, particular group, but it's uh, the chromite opportunity itself. Uh, if you valued our chromite resources, which currently sit at about 45 million tons, uh, that would value the company at well over 300 million. So in, es in essence, we're getting no value for the chromite, and we're only getting about half the value that we, uh, we believe we have in the nickel sulfide side of things. We have two near-term development projects. We have a nickel sulfide mine that's, uh, we would have had a feasibility study issued uh, by now, but unfortunately events conspired against us, and those events were out of our control. It was a, actually an announcement by the government of Ontario and Cliffs about their infrastructure development plans for the region. This has caused us to rethink our feasibility study. There were some assumptions in there in terms of, of road access into the property that were rendered essentially incorrect. So we have to reevaluate those costs and make sure that the, the feasibility study that we issue to the public is correct. And then we have the Blackbird uh, chromite opportunity, which is a, a pipeline project for us. Um, all this stuff. See, this is the nice thing about the iBooks, is you can just sort of skip by the stuff that nobody's interested in. Project is located in northern Ontario, at the suture point between the James Bay Lowlands and the um, Canadian Shield. And I'll just uh, replay that, because this is actually one of the problems, is sometimes you, do, uh, sometimes you don't have time to, uh, to see things. And is there a pointer here? brought my own. <laughs> so the Ring of Fire is located right here. There's the suture point between the Canadian Shield and the James Bay Lowlands. What the suture means basically is everything in this north, uh, northern part drains into Hudson's Bay and James Bay. Everything else drains into the Great Lakes system. This is one of the largest wetland regions of the world. Uh, it's a swampland basically, so there's significant challenges in terms of project construction. And it also happens to be about 300 kilometers north of any existing infrastructure in Ontario. Hence the importance of the Cliffs announcement and our challenges in terms of defining the infrastructure. And then the claims, as I said earlier, we own about, uh, we are the largest landholder in this camp. We hold about 112,000 hectares. That's about the size of Rhode Island. Uh, only about 10% of it has been explored. All of the discoveries are within this small area. That's where the four mines have been identified to date. A blow up of the geology of that region makes it all pretty simple. Basically you have a, a very large granitic pluton, you have a, a series of felsic volcanics that were probably extruded at some point uh, during, during a period of volcanism. At the contact point between the felsic volcanics and the granodiorite, there's an ultramafic intrusive that's been injected into the system. On the northwestern side of that intrusive, you have nickel sulfide deposits. On the southeastern side of that, intrusive, you have these massive chromites. And this is a classic differentiated ultramafic magma. Somewhere in there lurks these large, low-grade platinum palladium deposits. They're very, very difficult to see visually, um, but we know they're there just because of the geological setting of this particular region. Exploration for them, we believe, is probably more efficiently done through the underground workings that we're planning on develop for the, uh, for the nickel sulfide mine. Uh, as I noted earlier, we do have nickel sulfides tied up in our massive sulfide system, but we also have some just fantastic sections, like upwards of 30, 30 to 35 grams per ton of platinum and palladium in certain sections of the mine. 
We believe these may be offshoots, plays, but they add significant amounts to, uh, amount of value, uh, certainly as we're going through the mine life of the project, and we're looking forward to exploiting them. Total distance from AT12 down to Eagle 2 is about 10 kilometers. And so essentially this whole area is prospective for additional nickel sulfides. There's no rock outcrop to help us build a geological model. Everything here is based on geophysics and diamond drilling. So it's a, it's a very expensive and challenging exploration um, problem that we have. We don't have any rock on surface to guide us. This is a long section through the Eagle's Nest deposit. It's basically a pipe. It extends from surface down to a depth of about 1,600 meters. So that's probably about four times uh, the Chrysler building. Four of the Chrysler buildings stacked up one on top of the other. Grades, again, are expressed here in nickel equivalents. Nickel basically makes up 70% of our value. Uh, platinum and palladium is about 25%. And you see basically grades, uh, there's the dark blue, which you don't see any of, is basically less than 0.5% nickel equivalent. The lighter blue ranges between 0.5 and 1%. The red is 1 to 3%. You see that's dominant throughout most of the ore body. And the uh, magenta color is greater than 3% nickel sulfides. And if you look at level sections through the ore body, the first is at the 75 meter level, which is the, the top of the crown pillar. Uh, the next is midway through the reserve at the 600 meter level. And the final one is the bottom of the reserve at the 1200 meter level. Again, you see the dominant colors are red and purple. So this is a high grade ore body. And as I said, one of the unwritten rules in the business is good grade makes for good miners. Just makes our life a lot easier. We can explain our, all of our cost overruns because we have high grades. Uh, proven and probable reserves, 11.1 million tons, 1.7% nickel, 0.87% uh, copper, 0.89 grams per ton of platinum, and 3 grams per ton of palladium. And we have an additional mineral resource that extends from the 1200 to the 1600 meter level that has the potential of doubling our mineral reserve, but it's just simply too expensive to drill it off. It was costing us about a million dollars a drill hole to drill below the 1200 meter level. And just to re-emphasize the splits, 70% for the nickel, 13 for the copper, and uh, sorry, it was 17% uh, for the nickel, for the platinum and palladium components. Anywhere else in the world beside a road, this would be a standalone platinum palladium mine. It's as simple as that. It would pay the bills. In terms of cost of production, and this is again focused on nickel, uh, we would be one of the lowest cost nickel producers in the world today. If the mine was in operation, we'd have a negative uh, cost of production on a per pound of nickel basis because the platinum and palladium and copper basically pay for all the, the mining and the processing costs and the transportation costs. So that's a, a very nice position to be in. And in terms of the sensitivity, this is one of the projects, again, because of the high grade, it's extremely expensive, uh, sensitive to both metal prices and the Canadian and U.S. foreign exchange rates. Well, since you saw it, we'll, we'll talk about it. Sorry. In terms of capital costs, again, we would be one of the lowest capital cost projects out there today. Uh, looking on a per ton of nickel production basis, we're, we're coming in at about $36,000 a ton, which compares very, certainly much better than uh, the, the $100,000 to $90,000 range that you're seeing a lot of these nickel laterite projects coming in at. So both in terms of capital costs and an operating cost, we're in the lower quartile, and that's always a very, very good position to be in. Our feasibility, pre-feasibility study, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. We issued our pre-feasibility study last year in August. Uh, had certain assumptions in there about road routes and access into the ore body that again we recast in the feasibility study but we have to rethink now because of the recent announcements. But essentially it's demonstrating you have different discount rates, you pick your favorite. I was getting tired of doing presentations and always everybody in the crowd always had their own favorite discount rate. So I gave multiple choices here. But we're looking at about 431 as an NPV for the project. Initial capital of 734 million and sustaining capital over the 11 year mine life of 143 million. So it's not, uh, it's not capital intensive like most of the major nickel laterites. And the pre-feasibility study was based on nickel prices of 882, copper price of 308, platinum price of 1432, and a palladium price of 446. So not aggressive pricing by any stretch of the imagination. 
Most of the uh, long-term consensus pricing is significantly above that. If we were to plug those numbers into the pre-feasibility study assumptions, the NPV at 8% rises up to about 600 million. So you're getting almost for every dollar invested, you're making a dollar. That's not a bad, uh, that's not a re bad return on your investment in these days. Uh, although it's not a focus, I've got to talk about it, the chromite resources. Uh, again, I think the Ring of Fire has the opportunity to rival South Africa in terms of its chromite. Why is that important? Um, I've become a geologist. I haven't been a geologist for a long time, but I tried to put my geology hat on for a few minutes. The, the, the geochemistry of these ultramafic magmas, these magmatic mass of sulfide systems, is such that um, the amount of chromite that's in the system basically dictates that there's significantly more platinum, palladium, and nickel lurking about in this area. The problem we have is identifying it. Uh, because it's all covered by swampland, you don't have any geological outcroppings to help you map the area and put together the geological picture. It's buried under wet uh, soils, so airborne geophysics become a bit wonky. So it's, uh, it's basically hard work and effort and, and cost by putting in drill holes in the ground. But the, the chemistry of the system certainly indicates that this uh, has great potential. Uh, talked about the mine life. Our plan in putting this into production is actually focused on minimizing our surface footprint, uh, minimizing our environmental damage, and working closely with the, uh, the, the First Nations communities that surround the project site. This is a blow up of that region of northern Ontario. There's the ring of fire there. The recent announcement by Cliffs and the Ontario government talks about coming off a road right about here and basically running straight north-south. That's a shorter distance than the road that we proposed in our pre-feasibility study. Uh, we've proposed an east-west route, basically coming from this road, coming across and tying in all of these communities, uh, First Nations communities along that corridor. And then from there, it would extend into the mine site. So that was the basis of our pre-feasibility study, that was the basis of our feasibility study, but now we have a company with an $8 billion market cap, which I have to admit is significantly larger than mine, uh, committed to building this north-south route. We also have Ontario government support committed to building this north-south route. Uh, we're more than happy to cooperate with them. In essence, it reduces our operating costs because it's a shorter haulage distance to market, significantly shorter haulage distance to market. It's unfortunate, uh, I mean, one of the reasons we selected this routing was largely out of social, social responsibility. We were trying to work with the, uh, the First Nations communities. They have had a significant backlash against this proposed north-south route, but I think that's something that could be worked out over time. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just communication and making, making sure they understand the message and the opportunity that the development of this region offers for their communities. So uh, we're more than happy. We actually uh, will be entering into discussions with the government and Cliffs to, uh, to see if we can't cooperate on that, uh, on that infrastructure development on the north-south route. On a, on a site level, our focus has been minimizing our environmental footprint. Basically, uh, what you're going to see at the site is a, a road coming in to access the portal area. That's where our mine services will be located. We'll have an airstrip. Again, we're cooperating with Cliffs and the Ontario government on the airstrip construction. And we'll have a camp, and the camp's going to be more or less like a hotel. Uh, the concept is it'll be a First Nations run business. Both Cliffs and ourselves would be able to utilize the camp, and uh, we'd house all of our personnel there, and, and that all be fed and housed out of the same camp. We'd share the cost of that. Uh, so you'll notice a couple of things that might be missing here. Where's the mill? Where's the tailings pond? That's one of the keys to, to, to our whole development plan. We're basically, uh, we're basically planning on placing the mill underground. We're not gonna build a traditional mill building on surface. This is a, a film that we took at uh, Cadelco's Andina mine in Chile. It's a 100,000 ton a day processing plant. Uh, everything from crushing, grinding, right through to flotation, thickening, and, and uh, concentrating all housed in underground rock chambers carved out of the, carved out of the rocks in, in Andina. So we're using that model. We have a much smaller throughput rate. We're looking at about a 3,000 ton a day plant. We're looking at a maximum span in terms of the underground chambers that we're excavating of about 18 meters by 18 meters. 
And the reason why we believe we can, we can do all this is we have a very competent rock mass. That granodiorite that I talked about earlier is about five times stronger than um, concrete. Uh, we don't have to excavate uh, all the swamp lands out to get down to bedrock to put in our footings for the mill and foundations for the ball mills and, and the crushers. So when we first started looking at this project, it became quickly apparent this was a, a cheaper alternative than flying in structural steel, uh, rebar, cement, aggregate. There's no aggregate on site to produce anything with. So we're taking advantage of what nature has given us and, and looking at putting everything underground. Uh, you'll notice right away we talk about an aggregate source underground. That aggregate source is to provide the rock to build the airstrip and all the other surface facilities. It also provides us with chambers and voids that will allow us to store our tailings underground as a uh, cemented paste backfill. So that eliminates our tailings pond on surface. And if you, if you can imagine the difficulty of trying to store tailings on a tabletop flat surface with no topographic relief, that saves us a great deal of money in terms of site construction. So uh, taking advantage of what uh, everything gave us, you can see the mill layout here, and that's the big chamber. Crushing and grinding circuit will be over here. Production levels will be on 50 meter levels. Again, you're looking at about a million tons a year. The ramp has to advance at a rate of uh, a vertical rate of about 100 meters per year in order to, to, to keep the mine development going smoothly. We believe all of that's possible. Uh, access will be through twin declines and we've basically costed everything in the pre-feasibility study assuming ramp access to the bottom of the reserve to the 1200 meter level. That's probably not realistic. You know, at some point in time after we establish positive cash flow, probably in year three or four of the operation, we'll probably do an internal trade-off study about uh, evaluating replacing that ramp system with an internal shaft. And the internal shaft will allow us to proceed at even lower operating costs. Very strong team, very strong management team, board of directors with the company, great deal of experience. Uh, uh, Ted, Bassett, uh, Ted Bassett actually joined the company just recently and he is uh, formerly with Valley Inco. He's built the world's last two major projects, the uh, Boise's Bay um, project for Valley Inco and the um, Goro project. He was a project manager for both of them, so he brings a great deal of experience to our board. And on the management side of things, management's dominated by guys with 30 years experience in the business. I'm a professional geologist, I've worked all over the world. Paul Semple, our chief operating officer, he came out of the SNC Lavalin group of companies in Kilbourne Engineering, similar type of experience as myself. Glenn Nolan, our VP of Aboriginal Affairs, is a former First Nations chief in Ontario. So he's brought tremendous insight and he is also president of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. So a strong management team, strong board of directors, and our consultants that we work with are sort of the who's who of the Canadian mining industry. Sorry, Micon is the lead engineer. Uh, they've, they've been responsible for putting together the uh, uh, resource estimation and the entire report, the pre-feasibility and the feasibility. Cementation is one of the largest mining contractors in the world. Ototech out of Finland specializes in process plant design. Knight Peacehold doing our environmental work. Uh, Ozenko and Nuna Logistics are, are sort of logistics companies that have helped us a great deal. And talking about the right time and what I'm referring to in terms of the right time is basically the future going forward. This is more focused on chromite and, and nickel, but platinum and palladium are in the same boat. Same boat. We see very strong uh, future demand and growth for, for nickel, platinum, palladium, copper, chromite. All of these metals have a uh, uh, very, very bright future and we're planning, uh, planning on coming on stream at a point in time where they should be reaching a peak. And the other, uh, the other indisputable fact of the mining business is basically you like to start your project at a time when metal prices are high. <laughs> that, that also makes for very good miners. Uh, we're looking ahead, we're just completing the feasibility study now, unfortunately because of the announcement it's probably been delayed. Uh, but we're also planning on maintaining our environmental engineering, permitting, and, and uh, detailed engineering as we go forward. The uh, RCF deal gave us an additional $10 million in financing. There's other opportunities out there for us to finance the, the, the funding for our detailed engineering and permitting work. So we'll probably keep that going uh, as we rejig re the feasibility study to take into account the recent announcement by Cliffs and the Ontario government. 
We still think production by 2016 is possible, and that's certainly our target. And most of the uh, long-term forecasts for nickel, copper, platinum, palladium, they're seeing a significant increase in prices around the 2016-2017 period of time. So our project should be coming on stream just as these prices start to peak. Uh, do I have much? Have I taken up my time? Uh, on the corporate responsibility front, we're probably, uh, we're certainly one of the leading companies in Canada in terms of our engagement with First Nations. And that's very important. Uh, these are societies or these are communities that are extremely challenged. Uh, at the community level, you're basically looking at 95% unemployment. If you're not working for the chief and council, you're not working. Uh, significant dropout rates, high school dropout rates. Most of the kids don't finish high school. Even the ones that do uh, complete grade 12, they're probably only reading at a grade 6 level. Uh, we've done skill surveys in the communities to basically find out what people have the training necessary to accept jobs now. We've hired most of those and they've worked for us. We're working with them to upgrade their adult education needs. We've sponsored um, uh, training programs with the Federal Government of Canada to, to help upgrade the uh, adult basic education. We're helping the communities develop long-term business opportunities. We're very focused on the kids very, very focused on the kids because what we're trying to do is encourage them to stay in school. So we've brought in things like Dare Arts. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but Dare Arts is a, 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 an artistic program that basically focuses on at-risk kids, like uh, kids that are they're contemplating suicide and other bad things. Uh, it's been extremely successful in the community. Uh, we've had a significant turnaround in terms of like a significant decline in the suicide rate since we introduced that. We sponsored Mining Matters, which is a PDAC, a Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada initiative, basically to teach younger kids, like the little ones, about mining and what it all means for the future and what kind of jobs would be available to them. The first time we went into the two communities, we were expecting about 30 kids in each. We got over 100. So it was very well turned out, very popular. We've, we've sponsored it again last year for the second year in a row. We always sponsor, we never decline opportunities to fund school trips, uh, get the kids out of the community and show them what life is like in communities that are larger, uh, what mining, what impact mining really has on the land. We have a ring of we have our own char Christmas charity that we, uh, that we manage independently. Every year we make sure every kid in the community has a, under the age of 12 has a Christmas gift. And, and for some reason every time I fly up I end up playing Santa Claus. I'm not sure why that is. The other, uh, the other thing that we've worked on is called Mikawa. I don't know if the, the sound is coming through. But Mikawa is a social media website that we developed to communicate with the First Nations. And it's very videographic and, and graphically engaging. So you have a number of interviews, you have a number of people that are uh, spoken, uh, or, sorry, you have a number of people that are interviewed on camera talking about their experiences, uh, the, the First Nations leadership talking about their ties to the land and what the land means and the importance of the land to them. Um, a lot of uh, professionals talking about what a geologist does, what, a, what an accountant does. Uh, they just don't know. The First Nations people don't know. And they can't, you can't give them a book that's an inch and a half thick and say, here's your feasibility study. Give me your comments back in a month. Most of them are reading at a grade six level. So what we've found to be very, very powerful is this Mikawa.com website. We have our full project description available to it. It's very graphic, shows exactly where the roads are going, shows exactly what the impact on the land is going to be. And uh, it's been a brilliant means of communicating with the communities. And that's all. Thank you very much. Any questions? Doug? Yes. Uh, could you just expand a little bit on the uh, Cleveland Cliffs uh, announcement? You alluded to it in your talk, and, but maybe you could speak a little bit more detail about the implications it has for your feasibility study going forward. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's great news for us. Uh, I mean, the reality is Cliffs is an $8 billion company. We're a $100 million company. 
we've always recognized the fact or we're cognizant of the fact that in order to develop our deposits, our, our assets in the ring of fire, that we would not be able to, to fund the infrastructure independently. So having a, a major company like Cliffs commit to this program is, is great news for us. The route that they're proposing is actually shorter, so it will reduce our operating costs and, and probably make our feasibility study even more, um, more appetizing than it already is. And we're sitting, the pre-feasibility study was sitting at a return rate of about 30% uh, with the reductions in capital associated with the north-south route, and the reductions in operating costs, I can see that improving. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the most consulting engineers will only use a three-year trailing average for their, for their reserve designation. So that price is going to be much lower than the long-term forecasts. But even so, I mean, 30, 35% rate of return is a, is a very attractive project in today's market. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that, uh, that uh, things are, are trending the way they are. I mean, everybody's been struggling with, uh, uh, you know, the Greek crisis and all these other uh, issues that are driving down the markets and making funding more difficult. But, this is a solid project and it has a great, uh, a great future. It's one of the few I've ever come across that was a, as a geologist, as a professional geologist that sort of, I said, wow, this is, this is too good an opportunity to miss. So the Cliffs announcement helps us a lot more than, than it hurts us. Um, we plan to, uh, we plan to uh, certainly engage in discussions, further discussions with them. We're already cooperating in terms of the airstrip and the camp and some of the other, uh, some of the other issues at the, at the site level. So. There's synergies there. I mean, uh, you know, you could view it as a competition that they, they're, they're competition to us, but you know, they could also be very helpful to us in the long term. And the commitment by the government is even more important because this couldn't, I don't think this will be a, a private road. You know, you're not going to build 300 kilometers of road into the wilderness of Canada just for two companies. It's going to be open to everyone to use. I think it'll bring more exploration into the ring of fire and I think it'll lead to more discoveries in the future. So uh, uh, this is all good news for us. We're very pleased. But the downside is now we can't release our feasibility study because it was based on an access route that's perhaps obsolete. So what do you expect to delay the vague Right now it's difficult to say. I mean, we've had vague announcements so far from the government and Cliffs. They talk about a capital cost of $600 million. In order to release a feasibility study, and get your, your qualified people to sign off on it, you have to have a detailed cost breakdown of, of what that infrastructure is gonna cost you in terms of either capital, or if it's a toll fee arrangement, then what are the toll fees gonna be? So as soon as we gain some clarity on that, we'll have a better idea on the timing of the feasibility study. In a perfect world, knock on wood, maybe a month. But it could be longer. No problem. Any other questions? Thank you very much.